I was becoming conscious and aware of uh, who I was and the oppressive conditions that I was living under. I quickly came to see that this was something that I was interested in, something that was right, and something that I could dedicate myself to. I saw that we could really change conditions for black people and conditions in the black community. And at that time, I had three sons, and I really wanted to do that. I didn't want my sons to grow up in the world that I grew up in. My interest in the Black Panther Party was served by serving breakfast at the Hunters Point Breakfast Program. And on occasion, I did sell newspapers on Fillmore. I never joined the party as a quote unquote member, but always supported its program and did work as much as I could in the Breakfast for Children. We would go out and try to get those needs met, and those needs were basic human rights, basic land, food, housing, clothing, education, and justice, and some peace within the community. The police uh, in our communities were like an occupying force uh, there to protect the uh, property of outside interests, not uh, to serve and protect the people in the community. The Black Panther Party took up the challenge and uh, started uh, patrolling uh, the police to uh, ensure that uh, people understood their constitutional rights, uh, uh, just their rights in general, and to uh, make sure that uh, people weren't being uh, brutalized by the police. When I joined the Black Panther Party in 1968, my first experience with COINTELPRO was the assassination of uh, Al Prentice Bunchy Carter and John Huggins in Los Angeles. I never carried a gun before until Bunchy Carter and John Savage and uh, Sylvester Bell, until they got killed. I never carried a gun. I didn't have no use for a gun. I was functioning in the community. I was working free breakfast programs. I was working clothing drives, you know, organizations with uh, people in the community and the church. I need no gun. The involvement with the uh, Panther Party brought me in direct conflict with Hoover and his program, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program that was designed to uh, destroy dissent in this country. It was specifically geared toward preventing the rise of a what he called uh, the black, a black messiah. When COINTELPRO was at its height, which is in the 60s and very, very early 70s, that one of the main focuses was on the Black Panther Party. And in fact, J. Edgar Hoover, who masterminded COINTELPRO, labeled the Black Panther Party as the number one threat to national security in the United States. So at that time, Hoover authorized all kinds of illegal activity against um, the Black Panther Party. Fred Hampton, was, uh, uh, he was assassinated by COINTELPRO in Chicago, drugged, set up, murdered while he was asleep, actually unconscious in his bed. COINTELPRO caused so much dissension in the community, the fallout from this is, is still being felt today. There were people who were natural associates who were made enemies by letters and phone calls, while the FBI agents and people who planned this laughed in the background. They uh, uh, were law violators, uh, and they all uh, were law uh, enforcement agents. <laughs> In 1973, 13 alleged members of the Black Panther Party were arrested in New Orleans. Various detectives from police departments in other parts of the country immediately flew to New Orleans to participate in the interrogation of some of the arrestees. We were taken to the New Orleans City Police Department where we were stripped of all clothing, uh, down to underwear. <clears throat> I was thrown in a cell, a holding cell. I was put in a jail cell and questioned by uh, different jurisdictions. The jurisdictions of San Francisco, and New York, New Orleans, and Los Angeles, California. Inside that holding cell, there was a uh, Reuben Scott was there. And he was really afraid. He was trembling. He was scared. And I could tell he's been beaten on it. I was in New Orleans when my 
associates were arrested, John Bowman, Reuben Scott, and Harold Taylor. And it was just by coincidence that I wasn't arrested. I found out later that they had been tortured by the New Orleans police. I was in there for maybe five minutes and the door opened. Three uh, police officers in New Orleans came in, drug me up by my heels, took me to a chair where they handcuffed me to the chair and handcuffed my ankles and my feet to the, to the bottom part of the chair. Without asking me any questions, they, continued, they commenced beating me. They beat me, they punched me, they kicked me, they spit on me. They called me a lot of vile names. And then they told me that uh, they was gonna kill me if I didn't cooperate with them. The New Orleans Police Department would come into the room where a hot blanket would be taken from the bucket, dripping hot and wet, placed over my head, held there for, I can't say whether it was minutes, for seconds, it felt like forever. They came out with a plastic bag, put it over my head. And they started beating me with the bag over my head. <clears throat> about time I was about to lose consciousness. About to pass out, they'd snatch the bag off. And while I'm trying to catch my breath, they would start beating me again. So I asked them, I said, well, what's, what do you want? You know, they just continued on with it. They didn't ask me any more questions. They didn't ask any questions, really. Two of the detectives who came from San Francisco were named um, Frank McCoy and Ed Erdlatz. They had been investigating a police homicide that had occurred in 1971. Then they came out with this cattle prog. I knew what it was because being, uh, being off of a farm when I was a kid, I used to, my family used to go to uh, Louisiana every year to uh, to work the little family farm. And my uncles, they had a couple, of, we had some cows and they used cattle prods and moved those cows up chutes and stuff like that. So I seen that and I knew what it was. The cattle prod was placed on my genticles, placed in my asshole, placed under my feet, placed under my arms. down in my private parts, under my neck, behind my ears, down my back. I think I passed out one time, they woke me back up and uh, they was taking me to another room. Two detectives had me by one arm, by each arm, <clears throat> and a detective came out of nowhere and he just cold cocked me and knocked, I mean, he knocked me straight out, I was, I, I was unconscious. Another instrument that was used during the questioning was a ledger log book. And this ledger log book was used to hit me upside my head at times when I was not giving the right answers that was script for me. They took me into a holding cell. They threw water on me. I was soaking wet, it was cold. Pulled me out of there, uh, maybe about six or seven in the morning, and told me they had somebody they wanted me to talk to, and they, uh, I'd better cooperate, and if I didn't, I was gonna get more of the same. So they put me in there, there was uh, two detectives from San Francisco. I later found out it was McCoy and Ertelax. They started asking me questions, and they told me they had a, <clears throat> a script, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm sure I saw a recorder there too. And they was reading to me about what they said took place in San Francisco. I told them I had no knowledge of it. Then I did not answer the questions in the way that they wanted them to be answered. This is when the instruments that I named before would be used. Primarily by the New Orleans Police Department. They were the main physical aggressors the FBI and the San Francisco police and the Los Angeles police and the New York police were the ones to do the questioning after the physical abuse had taken place from the New Orleans Police Department. Torture has an ugly connection with United States history, at least dating back to slavery. 
the lynching of slaves who ran away, the um, castration, the mutilation of slaves um, was all used in this country and not sanctioned for hundreds of years. In the 60s and 70s, particularly against the Black Panther Party, um, beatings and um, interrogation, forms of torture were being used against members, members of the Black Panther Party primarily. And what happened in 1973 in New Orleans is one example. All during the time I, this was taking place, I could hear John Bowman in another room where he was hollering and uh, they, you could hear the licks being passed. They took what they call a slapjack. It's like a little short blackjack. And they start working the back of my neck, my shoulders. Then one would get down and he'd work my shins and between my knees. They would beat me like that. They did that. I don't know, it seemed like it was hours, but it, it could have been 30 minutes, could have been an hour, could have been two hours, I don't know. It's back again with the plastic bag. This time they had a blanket. <clears throat> uh, I don't know what they soaked it in, but it was really, really hot. And they just covered me with that blanket and put that plastic bag over my head. And I couldn't scream, I couldn't holler, I couldn't get my hands up to poke a hole in the bag because I was handcuffed to the chair and my legs were tied to the chair. And they kicked the chair over and uh, let me just suffocate. I was just about to pass out. They'd snatch it off, spit in my face, and they left me sitting there for a little while. McCoy and Erdelax, they started asking me questions, and I had no knowledge of the things they were asking me, so I couldn't answer them, you know. So they said, well, we'll they turn off the recorder and whatever they had, and they said, well, we'll tell you what happened. And then after we tell you, this is what we want you to say. So I did make statements I did waive my rights to an attorney, which means I waived my Miranda rights. I did all of this because of the physical aggression and the brutality that was being put upon my body. One got behind me and he took his hands and he slapped them like that over my ears. I couldn't hear nothing. My ears were just ringing so bad. I could feel the fluid running down my side of my face. And they were talking to me, but I couldn't hear them. All I could hear was ringing. Whenever they stood me up to make me walk, I couldn't walk. They had to just kind of just carry me back into the other room. And when they get me back in there, they start again. They would kind of grin and laugh. They would all laugh and they thought it was a lot of fun and uh, I was a big joke. They started asking me questions and so I started talking to them. Tell them doing just like they, I followed their whole script. Everything they told me to say, I said it just like uh, whatever Reuben told them, I repeated what Reuben said. So they said, uh, well, we got what we want and we're through. <laughs> The federal magistrate in New Orleans ordered me out of the custody of New Orleans Police Department. That's the only way I got away from them, to put me in the custody of the Sheriff's Department. And they had pictures of me, they had doctors that said that I had bruised eardrums. Everything that I said happened and JB said happened, we had, we had evidence to prove it, you know. And uh, they ordered us over to Paris Prison under the Sheriff's Department where they kept us in a cage. After all of that happened, years passed by. Um, because of the harassment by the FBI and other police agencies in Los Angeles, I could no longer live there. I had to relocate. So I moved to Florida, which in, that was in 1980. I moved to Florida, found a job, got married, had three kids, 
everything is going smooth. While I was in prison, I got an AA and a TA in electronics, and it made it easier for me to get into the field that I'm in now. I'm an electrician and have been since the time that I was released in 1977, 1978. I've worked for Los Angeles County as an electrician in their health services department. I've worked in the various hospitals around the county since 1981 till this, until this day. I met and married my present wife in 1977, just a few months after I was relieved from prison. I met her through a mutual friend. We've been together ever since and have lived a very peaceful life. We don't go out at night. <laughs> in uh, uh, 2003, I was uh, sitting in my home and uh, uh, my doorbell rang and here are two uh, uh, agents and they want to uh, interrogate me or ask me some questions about incidents happened uh, over 30 years ago in San Francisco. Just out of the blue, I get a visit from my uh, FBI. District attorney from here, and uh, McCoy of all people, he, he comes with him. I walk into the room and I look at him and I said, uh, what is this about? They said, we want to have a conversation with you. We want to talk to you about something in San Francisco. And McCoy says, you know what I mean? I said, well, you know, I think I need a lawyer. I don't have anything to say to you guys. He says, Harold, he said, we want to talk to you. I said, no. I said, because you know what you did in New Orleans, and you recognize the fact that what took place in New Orleans, that you, what you guys did to me and John Bowman, how you beat us and tortured us. And I wouldn't talk to him. The same people who tried to kill me in 1973 are the same people who are here today, 2005, trying to destroy me. I mean it literally. I'm very concerned. I'm angry. I don't feel like it's right. I don't feel like it's something that should go unnoticed. Or I don't feel like the government should be able to get away with continuously to harass. Two investigators, uh, Mr. Erdelatz and another FBI agent, uh, came to my door and told me they wanted to talk about white people. Instead of my telling them that I needed to speak to an attorney, I actually invited them in. And through the course of their interview, found out that they were investigating some unsolved crimes in 1971. And during the course of the interview, which turned out very, which started out very amiably, at the end, uh, Mr. Erdelatz was seething and told me that he intended to see us all behind bars, and he named a whole list of people, some I knew and some I didn't know. I started piecing together what was going on by interviewing each of the men who had been visited by McCoy and Erdelatz, and what became clear was from what McCoy and Erlatz had said to them was that they were investigating the 1971 police homicide that had occurred at the Ingleside Police Station in San Francisco, but they were also investigating alleged linkages between members of the Black Panther Party and me members of the Weather Underground. And so most of these men, when they were approached, were asked if they quote unquote knew any white people. And they were told that the focus of McCoy and Erdelatz's um, questioning was going to be about their knowledge of white people and not about their knowledge of any alleged crimes or any alleged personal involvement. As time went on, they asked for fingerprints from people, they asked for saliva samples from people, they threatened to use grand jury process in order to gather information from them. So then it became clear that there was more going on than that there may be a grand jury impaneled investigating the 1971 incident. One night, just out of the blue, Sheriff Department knocks on my door, I think it's about six police all together, six, three deputy sheriffs, uh, you got uh, two FBI agents and two uh, people from the state of uh, California. But they came to ask, tell me that they were serving a subpoena for me to uh, appear in front of grand jury. 
this is 8 30 at night time i said well you know what i need to contact a lawyer before i acknowledge any of this stuff because i don't understand what's going on so they said well you got to appear in court at 8 30 in the morning in the last couple of years i've been finally subpoenaed fingerprinted photographed threatened flown back and forth at government expense from Los Angeles to San Francisco to appear in front of a grand jury. When I appeared in front of the grand jury, I decided not to testify. When I refused to testify, I was held in contempt by Judge Dundero there in San Francisco uh, County Court and was jailed until October 31st when the grand jury expired. I refused to testify. I, t I stood on my constitutional rights. 14th, 15th, and Fifth Amendment. And uh, they told me that uh, the judge ordered me to testify. He asked me, did I understand? I told him, yes, I understand. And took me back from the grand jury, and I still recited my rights. So he held me in contempt, took me to jail. I'm not going to assist them after all they've done to my friends, after all they've done to me over the years, interrupting my life, faming me, sending me to prison making things, conditions and things hard for my children. I'm a family man. And when you take me away from my family, my children suffer. Uh, and my community suffers because I'm a community activist. And this was their whole purpose, was to dis just disrupt me from my focus and from the things that I do best, and that's serving the people and taking care of my children. So no, I will never cooperate with these people under any circumstances, especially since uh, they're criminals. These are the persons. They, they should be investigated. They should be locked up for what they did in New Orleans to my friends. I myself was locked up uh, for uh, approximately a month and a half. Put me in a cell by myself, wouldn't let me have no commissary, no pencil pen, wouldn't let me make a phone call, wouldn't let me contact my lawyer. I thought in my mind, this is like New Orleans. Next, it's going to start all over again but it didn't take place and I stayed there for a month and a half. The climate in the country, to me, is much like it was back in the, the 70s, the uh, late 60s, the early 70s. It's designed to uh, squash any form of dissent. If you're not going along with the program, then you're a problem. Uh, some of us uh, have taken the stand that uh, we consider that uh, whatever the consequence, we're not going to cave into this. The organizing that took place as a member of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense that I did, it was motivated by love of my people. It was motivated by a desire to to serve a greater cause other than myself. I still try to serve the community, community and I was functioning different functions in my community. And what happened with this experience is that it just remind me that it never goes away, that they maintain the same status quo, that uh, power and people in power that's gonna run over and exploit whoever they want. And they'll continue to brutalize, kill, Anywhere on the planet they choose to do it at, and they feel justified because they have that power. Currently, in the wake of 9-11, with the United States um, implementation of the Patriot Act, many of the um, behaviors of the FBI that have been condemned by the Church Committee report have been re-legitimized in the Patriot Act. And so the same kind of illegal activities that were happening under COINTELPRO have resurfaced under the USA Patriot Act. Grand juries are being used across the country to intimidate and to put pressure on witnesses to testify about things that they of no consequence in many cases. People from animal rights to civil rights to human rights, anyone like it was in the 70s who's an activist or speaks out against the war or even against the bird flu can be brought in front of a grand jury and intimidated. Thirty years later, uh, I find that nothing has actually changed. 
I'm being faced with charges from 30 years ago and actually with the same people that were charging me and accusing me of this 30 years ago. And, and actually what I see is that uh, Homeland Security is actually an extension of COINTELPRO, which uh, according to the government was illegal and unconstitutional. And I'm willing to go anywhere to uh, tell people about this experience and let them know that this still happens and it happens every day. And I, not only here, but same thing that's happening in Guantanamo Bay, same thing that's happening in Iraq, Iran, all over the world, same thing that's happened in Africa. Everywhere that he's been able to spread misery and exploit and try to take advantage of world resources, if you got something that the power structure wants, he does whatever he has to do to get it. I'm really sick of uh, these same people with the same program, with the same attitude and with the same agenda, and that's to destroy us, to destroy anybody that is strong-willed and who's willing to stand up and uh, fight for their community and their people. I myself was harshly punished. I myself at present time in 2005 being harshly punished for being a member of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. But I accept the challenge. I accept this challenge so that my children's children's children will have some dignity my nieces and nephews will have dignity and have purpose and understand the history of struggling in this country for basic human rights. And that's all we were trying to do, basic human rights.